we're going to get started. Wow, this is an awesome turnout. Thanks for coming. Not only uh, is this the first talk I'm giving at ElixirConf, this is also my first ElixirConf. So this has been a really fun time. So I hope you've all been having a uh, wonderful ElixirConf. Um, this is going to be a bit of a weird talk and a bit of a fun one. And something that's going to be a lot more concerned with the uh, how more than the why would you do that. Um, so without further ado, allow me to introduce my lovely experimental topic, uh, game programming patterns in Elixir, question mark, um, and specifically talking about uh, RPG battle systems. <laughs> All right, so the obligatory about me section. Uh, hello, I go by Digit in the community. Um, I am a senior engineer at a fairly large security company currently. I build automated API security scanners, which is about the farthest thing from games at the moment. Um, I am also currently working on ways to aid in the distribution of Elixir tools, specifically as like packaged up CLI apps. You can talk to me about that after the talk if you want. Uh, and I also uh, developed Teex Tex. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but that ended up being cited as one of the inspirations for Mix Install uh, and that landed in the Elixir core, which is really cool. Um, I am a generalist hacker who has uh, too many projects for their own good. Uh, I am super curious about basically absolutely everything. Uh, I really, really like building developer tools. That's probably what I like making the most, and I'm a very super wannabe game developer. <laughs> Uh, you can reach me at Twitter, and that's my GitHub, and that's enough time talking about me. Okay, so a quick background. Um, the idea for this uh, came from, I was sitting on the couch with my partner. We were playing uh, a PS1 game on the original hardware, and we were playing, we were playing Final Fantasy IX. Uh, I don't know if anybody's played that one. It's one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was sitting there, and they were playing the game, and I was like, man, this battle system is really cool. Um, I really want to make this an OTP. That sounds crazy. Uh, so the difference here with this, specifically this battle system, it was called uh, Active Time Battle, is abbreviated ATB in the game. Uh, and it was introduced in the fourth game. It was used in the fifth and the tenth, or, I'm sorry, the fifth and the ninth and the second tenth game. Thanks, uh, Final Fantasy, for that. Um, every character in the battle system gets this little gauge called the ATB bar. And uh, when it was full, then your character can act. So rather than like this person's turn, then this person's turn, then this person's turn, it's kind of like this real time thing where everybody's speed stat is like ticking up this bar constantly in real time. And then when it, it's done, it makes a pleasant little sound and you can make your move. Uh, and the enemies do the same logic, their bar is just hidden. Uh, and that sounded awesome to try and build in something like OTP. Um, so I submitted this idea uh, for a talk. It sounded crazy. Um, and then I got an email a week later that said I had a slot. So then I had to build it. So the rest of this talk is about how I managed to build something like this, uh, and both the good and the bad ideas. And here's just a screenshot of Final Fantasy IX. Um, that green bar at the top there, that is the ATB bar. So like that fills up, and then you can just like scroll back and forth between characters if like multiple are ready. It's very nice. So big disclaimer, uh, games are hard. <laughs> They're really hard to make. Um, and there are some really potentially terrible ideas ahead. Uh, but if that excites you, then this talk is for you. Yes. Okay, so if you think about it, at a high level, a game is really just a bunch of assets and some gameplay systems, and basically the assets are displayed in accordance to the rules of the gameplay system. Uh, that's like the most abstract way I could describe a game. And generally, all of that sits on top of uh, some kind of high-level API. Uh, that's usually called a game engine. Um, and so that could be like Unity or Unreal or any other kind of game engine. Uh, and they usually provide you with access to lower level things that you could care about like graphics and input and how to manage entities and how AI works and all sorts of memory management systems. And I could stand up here forever listing the amount of subsystems in a game engine and I'm not going to do that. Uh, instead, the ones up here are the ones we're kind of concerned with. Um, and of course, all of those sit on top of some kind of hardware abstraction layer. Um, Great, how am I gonna make that work? Uh, okay, well cool, we already have the beam, so that takes care of all that hardware abstraction because it just works on most platforms that we care about. Uh, this is ElixirConf, so of course I'm gonna use LiveView for the input and the graphics layer uh, because why not? Uh, and this over here, this is a bit of a question mark. I, how are we gonna represent 
these complex uh, behaviors because we're gonna have like I'm ambitious. I want like I want different weapons and different spells, and I want like effects over time and like status ailments and all sorts of crazy things. How are we gonna describe all these things in a way that's not gonna make me burn out in five seconds? Uh, well, there's a cool pattern that I learned uh, from doing a lot of hobby game dev outside of Elixir. Um, that's called ECS. Uh, raise your hand if you know what ECS is. Okay, so a couple people, awesome. So uh, this is a really common pattern in, in game uh, system developments. So this will be a review for the people who raised their hand. But ECS, it's an acronym. It stands for Entity Component System. Uh, and the best thing about it is that it is data-driven. And that is mainly the reason that I went with it. Uh, I really like being declarative with my behaviors, and ECS lets you do exactly that. So the quick overview, uh, entities. They are literally just a lightweight ID or a representation of something in the game world. Could literally be anything. It could be a rock. It could be the player itself. Uh, they don't have any behaviors on their own. They contain components. I put that in quotes because in pure ECS implementations, uh, sometimes just an integer is used, and they don't have actual like a list of components that they own. It's more so just like a loose collection of components, and then an ID references those components. Um, so if you're catching on, the components as a collection make an entity, whereas the entity is just this like light container that like references all those components. Uh, they are the thing that we're going to span all the domains. Uh, domains being your gameplay systems. So they're going to be threading in and out of like an input system and the rendering system and whatever system. They're going to be called in and out of all of those. Uh, these are the things that are going to be passed around a lot. A component is the easiest part of ECS. It is a bag of data and nothing else. You don't, uh, you maybe put some methods in it to help mutate uh, the or change the values, but they do not contain gameplay logic. Again, in pure ECS, some engines like uh, Unreal and Unity have an update method every frame uh, for every component. That's not pure ECS. Pure ECS is just, there's just data in the components. There are no, there's no gameplay logic. Uh, you can also use them to tag entities. So if you don't want to put any data and you just want to use them as like a, like a white label, like we'll just print out a label and stick it on and say this is an enemy, you could do that too. Finally, the systems. These are the fun part. Uh, they are functions, if you think about it. Uh, they're the domains of your gameplay systems. Uh, and what they do is they query the, the storage of entities or the collection of entities in your world, uh, looking specifically for components they care about. So if you have a rock, you don't want the input system to look at the rock, because why would the rock need to know about what is going on in the input? Instead, you would just want the input system to go to things that have an input component. So it's like a lock and key, where the components are the key and the system is the lock. So how did I map this to OTP? And this is where it gets super opinion land. Um, so entities. I really like processes. Do you like processes? I love processes. Uh, in, in some words of, of uh, Joe Armstrong, he really liked to think of mapping a lot of things to processes. Um, some, I think somewhere he actually was like, we can map the, the atoms in the universe to processes, um, which I thought was inspiring. Um, <laughs> Uh, components, we can just make these structs or maps. I like structs because they have more type, typiness to them. Uh, and our systems are just going to be functions because what they don't need to be anything else, I don't think. Graphics and input, yay, live view. Um, and uh, for if we need to do things like an observer pattern, we're in the beam, so we just have message passing out of the box, so we don't even need to worry about that. Awesome. OK, so we got our concepts mapped. Uh, I like graphs. I don't know if you like graphs. I like visuals. So let's pretend this is what our world is going to look like. We know that we're going to have some collection of entities that exist. There they are, nice little PID cubes. And we know we're going to have a live view display. And we know that these entities are going to contain some components, some kind of data attached to them. We know that uh, there's going to be a list of systems that are going to be mutating all of the components' data every frame or every tick of this engine. And the thing that's going to tick the engine is some kind of timer, some kind of consistent time interval so that we can have this simulation evolve over time. 
we're going to have some way to ask for the entities that a system cares about, because again, Brock doesn't need to know about input. And we're going to take that uh, information that we get from the entity store, and we're going to just pass it to the systems that care about it. And this is going to happen every frame. We're going to say, every frame, what's the state of the input? Mutate the components that care about the input state. And we're going to do that for all the list of systems. Finally, our live view is just going to be a portal into the state of the simulation world. And then we get to look at that, and it looks pretty instead of looking at a bunch of text. That's a fun diagram. Okay, so how did I deal with the world? So here's a little snippet from the world. It is a gen server. It has a few key components I'd like to point out. The first one is the clock ref. Uh, this internally uses an Erlang timer. I think it's called or an interval. Um, there's a thing about those where uh, it doesn't actually guarantee it'll be exact, but it'll be at least the time you ask it to tick at. And that's okay, because games drop frames sometimes. And uh, luckily, we have a very simple math trick that we take care of in the update methods. It's called delta time. We just take the time between the first tick and the next tick, and then we integrate that into our math equations, and then we know that things will be consistent whether or not the tick was the same length or not. I have a bunch of uh, casting functions for like pausing and resuming and uh, adding a system and adding an entity to the world. So at any time, I can just chuck a new entity into the world, and it'll start being simulated. And uh, in this very gnarly looking thing down here, I put the tick function. So this is what gets called every tick. What this does is it goes through all the systems and it executes the system uh, in a loop, basically. It'll just go through all the systems and uh, call this wants function. And this wants function, like I said, will give back what that system wants from the components. So a system declares like, I want input, I want entities that only have input and sprites. And so that's what that system will get when it gets called in this loop here. It'll just get the entities that have those components. Uh, here's the entity store. I used a weird module I didn't know existed in Erlang. Uh, PG2? Um, I had no idea that this was a thing. It's very cool. You can just group processes and PIDs based on an atom, which is perfect, because I just need a really quick way to query things. Um, and the thing about this is uh, I just kind of stick the world name because I want to have multiple worlds running in my application so I can have multiple people running multiple games at the same time. Uh, so all, everything's namespaced by the world and I just use module concat to smash those atoms together and I get a, like a kind of compound identifier for an entity. Um, so I just have a couple methods that you can pass in either a list of components or a single component and you can say I want entities with this list of components or I want entities with at least this component. So, pretty straightforward. Uh, fun fact, I learned that PG2 is deprecated, so that's fun. Okay, so how do I, <laughs> that's great, we have an engine, I guess. Uh, how do I author content? And this is a part that I really care about um, as somebody who has a kind of like both parts of my brain and like systems logic and also art. Um, I, you're not gonna be the only one writing things for your engine or for whatever game you're making. You're gonna have to hand this to script writers and gameplay programmers and scripters and all sorts of people like artists. How are we gonna provide a nice interface for people to make things in? Uh, what if one of my friends wants to make a new enemy? I don't wanna have to have them learn Elixir to like write all this stuff. Uh, and you know, of course, I, I, I did what any uh, functional you know, sane programmer would do, and that's to write an entire DSL for it. Um, so here it is. Uh, this is how you define a component in my DSL. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You just uh, use the DSL component uh, module, and then you can say, okay, I would like to define a component. Uh, here is its name, and here are the values that this bag of data contains. So this is now a reusable component, because if you think about it, this is not just gonna be used for the player, this is also gonna be used for all the enemies and everything else that might have stats. So you just kinda bundle up that data into a component and then you're set and you can just slap this onto any entity. Speaking of the entities, this is how you define an entity. You can literally just say, I want to define a component. So at the top there, it's the same component as the previous slide. Uh, you can just override some of the default values if you'd like or you can just leave them as default. You can see I'm defining uh, an entity here. I'm giving it a couple components. I'm saying it's got an actor stats, it's got sprites, it's got an actor name, it's got an NPC brain. We'll get more to that later. And it's got an active battle component. And all the entities are defined like this, just all in this little, little micro DSL. 
And uh, of course, systems are also defined in this. So uh, the coolest part about this is this wants up here. So remember how I said uh, systems need to declare what and what kind of entities they care about. This is where you do it. You say this is a system, and it cares about things that have this component and this component and this component. And uh, that's that's all you got to do. You just say wants this component, and then you define a tick method. And in this tick method, you're acting on one entity, and this is where you would do your mutation for one tick of the game. So this is the type of thing that would do the uh, the ATB bar filling. Uh, where it would just try to cap it off at one, otherwise it would increment it by one based on the speed. And that delta time being, that's, that's that math trick I told you about how it doesn't matter if the frame is like longer or shorter, you just integrate that in and everything will be consistent per frame rather than if one frame takes five seconds instead of one second or something ridiculous. Oh, the other cool thing. Uh, because this is a DSL and macros are ridiculous in Elixir, I can throw compiler errors when I do dumb things like try to use a component that doesn't exist. So that's fun. I like when the compiler yells at me. It tells me I do bad things. Okay, now on to the next section. There's a lot to cover. I'm going really fast. Uh, but hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. So defining gameplay. I went about this by uh, basically fi figuring almost everything could fit into the ECS framework. However, I did notice that there were some things like graphics, like the live view system, uh, input, and uh, a couple other subsystems needed their own supporting external architecture. Um, with the base in place, though, I could compose basically any kind of entity I wanted in the game. Once I had the ECS DSL ready, I was, it took no time to make any new kind of system or component or entity. It was just very pleasant to work in. All the systems are just going to handle the gameplay logic. And uh, honestly, it feels like magic when it starts working because I just be like, here's a player. They have poison, slap a poison component on them. Now the poison system suddenly sees them and starts decrementing their health automatically. It's like magic. It's really fun to watch it work. Ah, this, this was a fun part. So I don't want the enemies to just sit around doing nothing because that's boring. Uh, so I came up with the idea of attaching a brain component to NPCs. And uh, what this does is it loads an EXS script and then caches it. Um, and then I have a special scripting system that every tick, uh, if it's ready and can act, it will read that EXS script and execute it. So I could define all the brains as just one-off script files. Um, so that will let me define more complex behavior without having to write anything um, you know, super good. <laughs> I could just write some, some little script. Um, it would execute the, within the context of the world. It was nice and easy. It was lovely. Uh, bonus, I could hot reload the enemy AI while the simulation was running because it's an EXS script, um, which is phenomenal for uh, design iteration. That kind of thing in a game design system is like, you need that. <laughs> OK, so sneak peek, that's an enemy. Um, so <laughs> uh, shout out to my partner who made all of the art. Um, so here is a brain script for this very simple entity. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, there are some common things that get defined in all the brain scripts. Uh, in this case, there's a, a list called player characters, which automatically returns a list of PIDs of things that have input components or things that are under the player's control. So they're basically targets for these enemies. Uh, so I would just basically just pick a random player, uh, and then I do a, uh, a five flat damage across them. Uh, by doing an action type. Uh, and we'll talk about the actions in a second, but all this does is just set up an action and then executes it immediately. All right, so building more off that action stuff, um, actions get pushed into an input server, um, which has a system that evaluates it and just like pops the queue and evaluates things in order um, so that events happen in the correct order. <laughs> um, a specific... Uh, system is the one that really like deals with this. Uh, so there, I think it's called like combat system or something. Uh, this allowed all the input logic, because sometimes there's some messy conditionals, uh, to all be encapsulated in that system. And I didn't have input stuff like, sp like spattered all over my code. It was all just in one module. Uh, and the other cool thing is all the input code was generic. So you clicking a button to attack something and something attacking you all used the same code path, because they're all just the same kind of action. So here's just some helper functions and some of the types of actions that the engine defines. You can just easily define them by uh, making an atom. 
Uh, some of them have specific parameters, so it's like you can do physical damage, or you can do magic damage, or you can heal, or you can restore MP, or you can give a status effect to something. And anybody could call these, and they would just execute at the next tick. Yay, it's live view time, yay. All right, uh, so when you join the live view, I start link a new world, so I spin up a new world. I give it the uh, I give the PID of the live view display to the world so that I can tell it when it needs to draw and when it needs to update. I kept a back buffer. I put that in quotes because it's not really a back buffer. <laughs> That's a real graphics term, but it's what I sort of what I treated it like. The back buffer is just where I stage all of the drawable things in a frame before I'm done. Uh, and then when I'm done, I just say, okay, swap it, and then that's what gets displayed to you. So I can work on things in the background, because like some things might be in between states, and then I flip it to the front. That's a real thing that happens in certain graphics programming, but I just used, I reused the term. <laughs> I wrote some protocols um, that handle all the different kinds of drawable components on the front end. And uh, input was, again, using that common code path, I just send it into the input server, and it's all taken care of. So uh, in my live view, this is not the best live view, but it sure did work. Um, <laughs> I go through all the drawables and I draw them. <laughs> um, that facet down there, that is the protocol. Uh, so that just takes in a drawable component and the assigns, and that's the protocol up there, very fancy. Uh, and down there is an implementation. So you'll notice this, uh, that active battle, that's the same name as the component. So you, if you want a component to be displayable, you just go make a protocol implementation for that component name, and you can just draw the values here. So you can draw them as whatever you want. In this case, I'm drawing like a, a span. It, it, I think it's like a, a styled progress bar or something for, the, for drawing the ATB bar. Uh, and there's just a bunch of these. There's like some for the sprites, there's some for all the different health bars, and there's some for like the entity window. You'll see, it'll be fun. Um, <laughs> okay, so putting it all together, um, it's cool to watch it in Observer because you can actually see like the hierarchy of everything. So like there's our live view page and there's our world and below it is the input server. And and those are our entities. That's it's really fun to like see them all like nicely like in a hierarchy laid out. And if if you disconnect, of course all of it goes away. You could certainly disconnect it and like have a supervisor and like do all sorts of other fancy things to like maintain the persistent state of the world, but I did not do that. <laughs> okay. It's time to see it in action, and this is the this is the this is the part where things go really good or they go really bad. So we're gonna see. So I'm gonna throw a terminal over on this here. All right. I'm gonna fire up the the old front end. Okay. Okay. So I went with a bit of a retro theme. <laughs> so. This isn't the most impressive demo, but it is kind of fun. Uh, so I can, I can kind of manage some stuff here. <laughs> I'm gonna open up the debugger. Um, this lets me look at a couple different things. For example, uh, here's the live view pit. It's telling me I have no drawables and there's no world. Uh, so I'm gonna create a world. Okay, so we have a world now. So you'll notice all of those systems listed down there, those are all the gameplay systems defined. There's like all sorts of fun ones. One of my favorite ones is the Reaper system, which is the one that cleans up dead enemies. <laughs> so I'm gonna unpause the world. So now it's ticking. In the background, it's actually doing like a tick rate. Uh, let's spawn something. So remember, the whole point of this was to replicate the ATB system where like it loads and then you can act, right? So let's, let's, spawn, a, let's spawn a guy. There he is. and he's ready. And there he goes. <laughs> and it works! <laughs> but there's so much more. We have enemies. Remember this guy? <laughs> he's back. Do you remember what his brain does? Anybody remember? Five damage, you're right. How much health does does Guy have? Uh, <laughs> uh, I have bad news for Guy. We have another kind of cone, and it's a little faster. He's got a higher speed, so he's taking damage. Oh no. Oh, and he's gone. 
Isn't that sad? You know who else is sad? This sad cat. Let's see what he can do. I think he might be able to do more. Oh, he can do much more. He can shock, and he's frozen their ATB gauges. That's handy. That's a nice little status effect he can do. I don't know if that's enough. Let's give him some more help. Here's, here's, here's a little soda dispenser robot. Let's see what he's got. Soda bot. <laughs> also, uh, a fun fact, you can see the PIDs up here for all of the entities. Oh, he's low on health now. He's got it. He gets, they all have little special, and let's get rid of this guy. <laughs> get out of here. He could use some healing. Let's heal him. So he's going to cast. It's going to take a little bit to cast the spell. And he's healed. Look at that. That's nice. <laughs> I love teamwork. Oh, we're going to get rid of that guy. We're going to get rid of that guy soon. Oh, I'm doing so good on time. This is wonderful. I could do this for days. Uh, OK, let's just get rid of this guy. Great, wonderful. Look at that. A battle can happen. That's wonderful. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give a refresh real quick. And I'm just going to show off one more thing here. I'll open up the debugger so you can see it. Uh, I'm going to unpause. And I'm going to spawn so that the enemies can have way more complex like behaviors. So this, this guy here, I love this guy. He, uh, when he has no friends, he, um, he does this, he does this kind of thing where he just, he spawns some. Yeah, there he goes. So now he has friends. He has a bunch of other things where if his health is below half, he starts doing crazy things. I'm not going to have time to go over all of this, unfortunately. But uh, I am going to open source all of this uh, in the coming days, so you all can check it out. OK, back to the slides. Thank you. OK, I have some conclusions, because remember, this is all some insane experiment. Um, OK, let's go over the whoopsies, the gotchas, and the bugs uh, live view. Um, I never opened Inspector for a reason. <laughs> the, this is good local. Uh, I would not recommend deploying it to a server on the other side of the country and expecting the latency to be good. Um, I didn't spend any time optimizing the wire across the, the, the data across the wire. There were definitely ways to do it. In fact, a lot of things Chris McGord talked about this morning, I was like, I wish I had that. Uh, so I might check that out. Um, OK, so the entity data store, uh, PG, like I said, PG2 is deprecated in OTP24, and I did not know that. Uh, PG is the new one, but it's missing some things, and I'd have to do sets on my own, and I just did not feel like dealing with it. And it was like a month out, so I just kept using PG2. <laughs> uh, I could honestly cache some of the results of asking for what entities have what components, because if you think about it in the scheme of a few ticks, uh, it's not often you're adding or removing components to things, so you can really ca get some, some benefits there by caching stuff. Uh, race conditions. I ran into only one while developing, which I was very happy with. Uh, if you don't know what that would mean here, it would mean that something read from a PID and then like in the middle of doing something, something else wrote to it and now we have bad data. That only happened once uh, and it was because I just did something stupid. Um, yeah. Uh, things that I would do if I had more time to work on this. Uh, I would make a WebGL based front end instead of a Live View one. Um, Live View was just a fast way to get some images on the screen. Uh, I would want a more expressive query language for querying for entities. So saying like, has this but not that. So then you could really have like a really powerful system like definition and saying like, I want things that have poison but not this item or like anything like that. Uh, I want to decouple Live View again. I really just want to remove Live View from it. I mean, it w don't get me wrong, it was awesome to get it working in Live View, but I really wanted to do the WebGL thing. I just didn't have the time. Uh, I wanted to make a more scene graph like tree where I could like define the order of the components. Um, right now, they just like draw top to bottom, and I'm using a bunch of CSS hacks to like keep them in the right order. Uh, and I would write a DSL for defining those uh, protocols because I think they could use some, some facelift there. <laughs> Uh, Multi-node multiplayer, three question marks, two. Um, I, uh, yeah, I could. I, I'd have to be careful about more atomic operations on the entities. But the cool thing about PG and PG2 is you could actually have those entities scattered across multiple nodes in a cluster, and you could still read from them, and it would be great. Uh, so you could totally have like a multiplayer system and all sorts of other fun stuff, if anybody wants to figure that out. That'd be cool. OK, so misc notes. Uh, macros are extremely overpowered in Elixir. Wow. I love them. 
They are awesome. I almost want to keep, like, I want to use that DSL to define gameplay, like, even outside of this little, like, toy project. Like, it was just so much fun and so easy to, to write. Um, I already have plans for, like, DSLs for things outside of Elixir, like, writing dialogue trees, writing proc gen rules, all sorts of little DSLs to, like, help aid in game development. This isn't the first time that I've heard people using functional languages in, in game development. Um, a notable example is uh, Naughty Dog, one, a very large company. They use, I think it's a scheme dialect. They use a scheme dialect for a few different things. And one of the reasons they like it is because it, it blurs the line between functions, functional stuff and data. Um, they use it as both a data definition language and as a scripting language. If you've ever played Jack and Daxter on the PS2, everything is like a Lisp language in that for like uh, the gameplay scripting. It's really cool. I think Elixir has a promising future in uh, some developer tools, you know? So even if they're not bundled in the engine or anything, right? I think that they have the ability to have these really great command line tools, these great command line scripts, DSLs for defining data definitions. It's, I think there's a lot of potential. I initially went in expecting all the async elements to be like in the OTP to be the big star, and it was. It was like awesome to have all this working out of the box. Um, but also those other features I just mentioned were a huge like, benefit while writing all of this. And one of my most wishful things is I would love to be able to actually use this in a game engine as a scripting language. There's a project called Atom VM. I, I, forgive me, I don't remember who is the author, but it's a tiny little C uh, uh, beam implementation. It's not complete yet, um, but I, I have some back of my head thoughts about how to integrate that into an engine. <laughs> so I'm maybe, we'll see, we'll see. I have some special thanks to give out. Um, my partner for doing all of that character art and the animation, they did a fantastic job. Um, the Elixir Conf staff and organizers for accepting this ridiculous idea. And uh, all of you for coming. Uh, that was, uh, it means a lot to me that you came to see this. So thank you very much. I, I have some time for questions, and I think I have like 10 minutes for questions, which is great. Um, and if you ask a question, I have stickers of the characters from the demo, and you will get one. Oh, there's a few. Okay, let's, let's start. Let's see you, yeah. What's the frame rate? I think it's something like, so it's, it's hard because there's not like, I had to do some weird math to like figure out the milliseconds, but I think it's equivalent to 30 FPS constantly. You could adjust it to anything, really. Yeah. Uh, so you're concatenating Atom to get to uh, other keys for GPUs. Um, what, what's the size of that set of like all of the Atom chips that you can concatenate? Is, did, you, did you run into issues with that? I, I didn't run into any issues. I imagine you might. Like, yeah, so I. <laughs> You could potentially blow up the atom table, but um, I don't think you would, because you probably would only have a few hundred, maybe a thousand components in like a large game. And there's, I forget how many atoms, you can have a lot of atoms in, in the beam. So I don't think you'd run into that issue. Um, unless you were running like tons and tons and tons and tons and like multi-node stuff, maybe then you'd be concerned. Um, and you might want to namespace it a different way, yeah. That's com yeah, it's completely handled out of band. Um, the way it works is it just pushes, it just throws the drawable things at Live View, and Live View just takes care of it. So you really could swap that out with anything. You could, you know, yank out the Live View component. It's the simulation world is actually a separate project. It's like in a different folder. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could you could do that absolutely. Um, I I just wanted to try and implement like a, a pure ECS system, so like I only use data. I actually also only made it so that the data could be uh, like one level deep, so like you couldn't put maps in components because I wanted like I didn't want to have to do like deep map updates and stuff like that because it can get expensive. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, if the delta is a constant that you know offhand, like what do you give the delta from the 
OK, yeah. Yeah, so I just track uh, the time from at the beginning of the at the end of the last frame, I just store store away when that frame ended, and at the beginning of the next frame, I just subtract the timestamps, and then you get the delta time between the last frame and the frame you're currently in, and so that is what gets passed into all the systems is delta time. Oh, so you're passing the delta to like the system will say here's how much time. Yes, yeah, you 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 inform the system every tick. Here is how much time has passed since your last update, so that it knows it can. Can compute correctly to compensate for how long the delay was. Yeah. You can <laughs> come find me after the talk. Everybody who asks questions, come find me. I got a. Yeah. I okay. I got a bag of them. So yeah. Yeah. There is the only persistent thing in the world is the entities, the list of systems, and the delta time. Uh, the systems themselves persist no data. They are stateless. So what they get in is just the, the state of the components at that tick. They mutate it based on their rules that are defined, and then they you know store it away in back into the the component. Um, and then the system just is it's 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 stateless. They they have no uh, state. You could for some things like in a real game engine, a lot of time you'll have a system that has state, like the controller state and stuff like that. You keep that in the input system and then pass that to what you need. Um, but in this case, they're all stateless. Yeah. What about ray caching? What was it? What about ray caching? Ray caching. I don't. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have um, a like a. Like a, a grid for, for actually like X, Y positions. You could absolutely do that though. There's nothing to stop you. Like I said, that live view, like view stuff is like just bolted on so you could view the simulation running. But that engine is generic enough where you could make, if you have a vector type or you define a vector type and you kind of extend the DSL to accept it, you could use it as a component and then just have position and give things positions and now entities suddenly exist in a grid and you can start doing things like ray casting, yeah. <laughs> Two questions. Uh, yeah, here. I was just going to ask, did you write tests for any of these questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's one more question here. Yeah. I was about to ask, would you do this again, but it seems like you're going to extend it. I, I don't know if I'll extend exactly this. I'm definitely going to open source it at some point. I'll clean it up um, and open source it. Uh, but I think my next step is definitely I want to do a lot of more like some serious game dev projects and hobby stuff, but I definitely want to find ways to use Elixir in that pipeline. Because um, the whole reason why I did this was I wanted to take Elixir from the start of game development to the end, like all the way through, no matter how crappy the end product was, and see where it stood out. And that like DSL section was like really where it stood out to me and how you could do the data definition. So I think I'm going to find ways to use that. Um, maybe I'll try to like integrate it into Unity or something. We'll, we'll see. Something crazy. I like doing crazy things. Yes. Oh, to change it from PG two to PG, I th I do not remember exactly, but I think there there was just something about the way that the API was exposed through PG that it was lacking a function. I'm gonna have to look it up. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I I considered using an X table. Yeah, I just I I liked processes and I thought the idea of modeling them was really elegant as processes and so I just ran with that idea. But yeah, I think that was, that's a totally valid way to store that data too. Yeah. How did you model like that ability and also how did you model the AI? Like from a high level. Like model like like how to like organize it. Like so everything Everything is is in components. Like that's where all the data gets stored. So like if somebody, uh, if if the state of like something changes, it's recorded at, into the component by another system. So that another system down the line will pick it up and read it. Um, so it's like the AI system was like, if they're ready. So like if their ATV bar was full, execute the script that is defined in their AI component. So like the AI system is reading that data. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, everything is just reading and writing to components. That's all. It, that's all it is. But is there any logic that has, has to happen like outside of the AI system? Now? Like, are you able to only have AI logic only? 
it was only in one, it, it, everything is uh, siloed in its systems. Like only AI logic happens in the AI system. Um, it only does one thing. Yeah, yeah. So you just have to you have to be conscious of the ordering of the systems, um, which is pretty straightforward. Um, you can do some more fancy. So Unity has its implementation called Dots, data oriented something, and uh, it has a way you actually declare dependencies, and it tries to actually like pack them into a way where it like parallelizes as many systems as it can while keeping dependency order in check. I don't have any fanciness like that, so I just have them straight run top bottom. I thought about allowing like a parallel like true flag, kind of like how you can do that in tests in EX unit, where I could be like, this system is safe to run parallel, go ahead and parallelize it, um, but I didn't do that. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good point. Um, you do have to be aware of that. All right, I think I'm out of time. Uh, thank you so much.